All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Welcome to BugFest. I'm so glad you've all decided to take a Saturday in September, come out to the museum. Who has tasted bugs today? Yay. Hands up if you've had a buggy snack. Was it delicious? Clap your hands. OK, I don't think that was as many people as raised their hands, but that's OK. Uh, how many people have met a live bug today? Show of hands. Let's see it. I hope that's everybody. There's lots of live bugs running around all over the place. Well, not running around, but you know they're, they're contained. So I hope you get to see some of those, too. Uh, and who, saw, who has seen something incredible, something fascinating that blew your mind? Like I heard that today that somebody saw a baby dragonfly, and they had no idea that they were just like these little things that looked like grains of rice stacked on top of each other or something, instead of big and beautiful with wings already. So yeah, hands up if you've seen something amazing that you didn't know about before. Yeah, that looks like a lot of people. That's the most exciting part for me. Well, welcome, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm curator for the Daily Planet Theater here. I get the cool job of introducing the really smart, talented, and incredible people in the world of science to come into the Daily Planet Theater and share with us a little bit about what they know. And you can probably already guess, but what is the theme bug for this year's Bug Fest? Dragonflies. Dragonflies. Yeah, absolutely. So. For our keynote address for BugFest this year, we went and got a dragonfly expert. In fact, he told me earlier that he owns, well, sort of owns, more than 40,000 dragonflies. Was that right? So the University of Alabama has a research collection. Dr. John Abbott is the director of the Museum Research and Collections at the University of Alabama. He's a dragonfly expert of more than some years, I won't date him. Give him a warm welcome. Put your hands together for Dr. John Abbott. Thank you so much, Chris. <clears throat> well, I uh, can tell from the hands up earlier, everybody's having just a, a fantastic time today. I know I am. It doesn't get much better than to get to spend an entire day uh, just surrounded by people who love insects as much as I do. And what I want to do this afternoon is tell you a little bit about the, the one group of insects that I really love, and that's dragonflies and damselflies. So I want to give you just a little bit of a kind of peek behind the curtain, if you will, into the, the wonderful lives that these guys uh, lead. First of all, dragonflies and damselflies. There are two distinct groups uh, that we're talking about. They belong in the insect order Odonata. And that gets its name because of the Greek root odont, which means tooth. If any of you have gone to an orthodontist, they straighten your teeth. It's the same derivation of the word. So dragonflies and damselflies, because the adults have these large mandibles, whoops, let me back up here, have these large mandibles, that's where they get the ordinal name Odonata. And then how do you tell a dragonfly from a damselfly? I hear all sorts of people giving, giving, you know, they ask different things. They'll say, well, aren't dragonflies bigger than damselflies? Well, it turns out that the largest extant or living odonate today is a damselfly in the tropics. So you really can't say that dra dragonflies are larger than damselflies. Sometimes I'll hear people say, well, aren't dragonflies the boys and damselflies the girls? Nope, that's not it either. The, sometimes people will say, well, isn't it the way that they hold their wings? That damselflies hold their wings back over the abdomen, dragonflies will hold them stretched out. Well, that works for most of the ones here in North America, but actually there's a dragonfly in the tropics that holds its wings back over its abdomen like this, and a number of damselflies, including right here, that hold their wings spread out. The best way to tell these two groups apart is to look at the wings. And uh, the dragonflies, this kind of bleeds out a little bit here, but the dragonflies have, the wings are broader basally. They're not the same size and shape as the forewings, all right, the hind wings. Whereas in damselflies, the, all four wings, the four wings, the ones in front, the hind wings, the ones in back, they're all the same size and shape. So that's the best way, no matter where you are in the world, to be able to tell these guys apart. I've never given a talk in a planetarium. It's very circular. <laughs> uh, so one of the other cool things about um, uh, dragonflies is their ancestors. You can't really begin a talk about dragonflies without beginning at the, at the beginning, right? And the ancestors to Odonates uh, lived some 320 million years ago, 250 to 320 million years ago, 
and the, uh, what's called the Pennsylvanian. Uh, and while a lot of them were about the size of the ones we have today, some of them were quite large. And uh, we know this from the fossils like this you see of a wing here. Some of these uh, had wingspans of nearly 30 inches. So just imagine a dragonfly with a wingspan of 30 inches. I mean, I dream about these kinds of things, right? To put that into perspective, this is what it would look like compared to a, a normal-sized dragonfly that we have today. So we don't have these large dragonflies anymore, unfortunately. Uh, largest one, largest dragonfly has a wingspan of maybe about six and a half inches. Largest damselfly, about seven and a half inches. So much, much smaller than, than 30 inches. Now I want to take you through a little bit of the, the cool things that they do in terms of their life history. And so we'll start at the stage where they're laying eggs. Uh, all damselflies and some dragonflies will lay eggs actually in vegetation. Here that's doing it above water. Sometimes they'll do it below water. And if you know what you're looking at, you can actually see these eggs. So what look like little bird footprints in the vegetation here are actually all of these damselflies laying eggs. Those are actually the eggs in the vegetation. Uh, so sometimes they'll be above water, sometimes they'll be below water like that. <clears throat> A lot of dragonflies will simply be flying around and drop their eggs into the water. They'll come down, sometimes in a pair, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but they'll come down and they'll drop the eggs in the water. Sometimes they'll, they'll, uh, you'll see them throwing eggs, uh, basically, at the shoreline with, uh, with a water droplet. And then when those eggs hatch, after about a week or so, uh, they turn into a nymph. It's the immature stage, the baby dragonfly and damselfly, if you will. Uh, and they live in the water. And the way you can tell the immature stages of damselflies and dragonflies is to look at where their gills are. So this is a damselfly. You'll see it's got its external wing pads. This is where the wings are developing. It's the head up here. But you'll see it's got these three gills coming off the tip of the abdomen. It uses those not only to respire, to breathe, but also to swim around. That's the way it gets around. A dragonfly you can recognize because it does not have those gills coming off the tip of the abdomen. Um, they, they do have gills, but they're actually in the rectum. They're inside the body, and actually what happens is they, they siphon in water, with, it's, got, it's got the dissolved oxygen in it, through the anus, through the butt, if you will, flows over these gills in the rectum, and actually oxygen dissolves out. And the added benefit for a dragonfly, you may think, well, that doesn't sound like a very pleasant way to breathe, and I, I kind of agree with that, but they can get around really easily because they shoot water out of their butts then, and that's how they move around in the water. So you do want to be careful if you ever pick up a dragonfly nymph out of the water and you get splashed with it, just remember where that water has been. So I'm an aquatic entomologist. I love the, the aquatic stages, the immature stages of odonates. Most people are familiar with the wing stages. You know, they would recognize them, but not the immature stages. And so I always want to make sure and, and try to, you know, get people excited about this stage. This is just a bunch of, of uh, images, a collage of different families and species of dragonflies and damselflies. And so you should be able to tell damselflies here. You should be able to pick them out with the gills coming off the tip of the abdomen. Um, whereas the others are dragonflies. They're not as colorful uh, as the adults. They tend to be greens and browns, and that's so they can blend in with their environment in the water. Uh, but they have some very neat life history traits uh, nonetheless. And one of those is that their lower lip, uh, called the labium, is actually this toothed, hinged, alien-style type uh, structure. It actually covers the, the, the lower part of the mouth. You can see it right here. You can see it right here. And actually, when they see a prey item, uh, they will extend it out, open up alien style, grab their prey, and then bring it back in. Uh, they will feed on mostly biting flies, mosquito larvae, things along those lines, but they can feed on larger things too. So here's a little video just to show you some of these things I've talked about so far. You notice the abdomen going back and forth there. That's where it's taking in water. Here it is, it's going to spin around. You can see it siphoning water in through its butt. It's literally how it breathes. <clears throat> and here is how one eats. So this is a little, uh, basically an earthworm relative, a little segmented worm in the water. It sees it, it grabs it with that, that labium, brings it back in, and then starts to feed on it. 
here kind of slurping it up like a, a spaghetti noodle almost. They're very visual uh, predators as both nymphs and uh, adults. And so you'll see them kind of move towards their prey, uh, getting a fix on them. And everybody can see that labium extend out, right? Very, very fast. Sometimes in some species it can send out about a third of the length of the body and a very, very rapid uh, movement. Now they feed on, like I said, uh, mosquito larvae and other biting flies and things like this that are, uh, you know, that we don't like. So they're very beneficial uh, as nymphs, but they can feed on larger things as well. This is a common green darner dragonfly nymph. A lot of you are probably familiar with the adult common green darner feeding on a mosquito fish, a gambusia. And if you watch it, you'll see it actually, I'll play it back in slow motion here, you see it actually move sees the fish, visually moves to, to target it, and then grabs it with that labium and brings it back in. Now, I love all wildlife, but I have to say, for an entomologist, anytime you see an insect preying on a, on a vertebrate, that's pretty cool. Um, and this thing would eat this fish over about 18 minutes. Uh, just simply chews it down. And to give you an idea of what's really going on here, this is its head, right, its eyes. These mandibles are up here. This is this labium that's hinged and holding onto the fish. And so here you can see a little bit better. It's actually just grabbing a hold of the fish with this labium, but feeding on it with those mandibles up there. And this is the way that, that dragonfly and damselfly nymphs eat. Whoops, shoot. Sorry, I hit the wrong button there. There we go. All right, so then nymphs, uh, when they, they uh, will live anywhere from a, a, about a month in some very fast species to, uh, on average, around eight or nine months. Uh, they will come out of the water, either on a, a rock horizontal surface or on a piece of vegetation like this, a vertical surface, to emerge. Uh, and this is a dragonfly actually emerging, so that it's coming out of its skin, what we call the exuvia, that dragonfly will actually come out. It'll start to expand its wings and its abdomen. This whole process took place over about three hours, to give you an idea. And usually it happens under the cover of darkness because it, they're very vulnerable at this time. They're very susceptible to predation. And so it happens usually under the cover of darkness early in the morning. But sometimes you'll get an opportunity to see this during the day as well. And what happens here is we have a very freshly emerged dragonfly that we, we refer to as being tineral. And what that means is it's very soft-bodied. The, the wings are very glistening, very soft. Uh, if you were to touch the dragonfly at this point, you would actually probably do physical damage to it. And so you want to be very careful. If wind blows it, if, if rain hits it, anything like that, then uh, they uh, can be damaged or die. But within a few days, uh, being exposed to the sun, to UV rays, and feeding a little bit, that dragonfly will turn into that. It's the same species. So they'll develop their coloration and become the dragonfly that you're familiar with at that point. Now, in addition to going from a tineral to a, you know, a colorful dragonfly, they also will develop changes in color uh, as they mature. This is called an eastern pond hawk, very common dragonfly around here. And this is what they start off looking like. This is a young male. This is a male that's in transition. So it's the same species, but you can see it's starting to develop this blue color. You can see still some of the green on the thorax there. A little bit more here, it's, its overall color is completely changed now to this bluish color. And that is something we call pruinescence or pruinosity. It's this waxy covering that a lot of dragonflies and damselflies get, especially males, but females too in some species, as they mature. And it gets its name from the coating that you see on plums. Plums belong in the genus Prunus, right? So that's where the, the name Pruinosity or Prunescence comes from because it's a very similar kind of waxy covering that you see on fruit like this. Um, you can also have a sexual dimorphism. That is, the sexes look different. So here's a mature male, common whitetail, 
And you'll notice the coloration on the wings. It's got this uh, bright white abdomen, which is that pruinosity that I mentioned. This is a female of the same species. So different wing pattern, lacks that, that uh, white on the abdomen. So that's what we call sexual dimorphism. And you see that a lot in, uh, in odonates. And in particular in the damselflies, the males tend to really be a lot brighter colored than the females, very much like birds. Now, another really cool thing about odonates is their vision. Uh, if you've ever looked at dragonflies closely at all, then you notice that their head is just largely made up with eyes. Insects have three different types of eyes, but the primary eye in most insects and in dragonflies are the compound eyes, these large things right here. And these are made up of individual facets called omatidia. Uh, and on a large dragonfly, there can be some 30,000 of these facets in each eye. So just imagine that. Each one of these actually has a lens. So they have almost 360 degree field of view. And while they don't have as, as acute a vision as we do, that is, they, they don't, you know, what we think of as a sharp image, they don't get that. But really, if you think about each one of these omatidia forming a, a pixel in a larger image, if you will, that's kind of what happens. And it comes together to form a single image. Uh, a, an illustrator uh, a number of years ago actually came up with this drawing to kind of make a comparison of what it would be like if we had compound eyes and, needed the, the, and wanted the same level of visual acuity uh, that we currently have. Our, our eyes would have to be huge. And that's why dragonflies, they don't, you know, insects, it's a sacrifice, basically. Evolutionarily, evolutionarily, they have the vision that they need to do the things that they need to do. But it's not as good as what we would consider great vision. This is a, a video uh, that the Houston Museum of Natural Science put together. And it shows uh, a woman here uh, in red uh, standing in front of a green bush. And this is what the dragonfly uh, would see of uh, the same thing. You notice there's not a lot of red. Most insects don't see reds and yellows. They see more blues and violets. Uh, and you also notice that, that it's not what we would consider a, a good image unless it's, the subject is very close to the eyes. But they're very good. This type of vision is very good at capturing motion. And so if you've ever gone out and tried to capture an insect, uh, I mean, pardon me, capture a dragonfly, you find out that they're actually really good at math. They can calculate on the wing exactly how far your arm is, how long your net is, plus one inch, and that's where they always stay. Uh, they're really good at escaping predation, and they're also really good at capturing prey. Because they're visual predators as adults as well. So here's a damselfly um, feeding on a deer fly, something that most of us aren't too fond of. Again, as adults, they feed on... Uh, the, the biting flies like deer flies and mosquitoes and things along those lines. But they will feed on other things too. Uh, many dragonflies will feed on other odonates. Here's a dragonfly feeding on a damselfly. Uh, some species are even cannibalistic. Here's the eastern pondhawk that I showed you earlier, um, a mature one feeding on a younger one. All right, so it's the same species. So they can even be cannibalistic. They're very aggressive uh, predators. Uh, some large adult dragonflies will even capture and feed on hummingbirds. It typically happens around a hummingbird feeder, so a bit of an artificial situation, but it, uh, there are a number of uh, records of that. Now, again, if you've looked at dragonflies and damselflies, around ponds especially at all, you've no doubt seen this. And you no doubt figured out what was going on, that they were mating, but you might not have known exactly what was, you know, how that was happening. Well, in some uh, odonates, particularly in some damselflies, they actually have some courtship behavior. This is a species that you have around here. It's called the ebony jewel wing. And males will actually come up and flash their wings at females in a certain pattern to, to gain their attraction. All right? So it's a, it's a basic, it's dating. It's a little bit of a courtship period. Uh, other damselflies, this is a, uh, an African species have colorful legs, and they'll do the same thing. The male will come up and flash the inside of its legs at the female to gain her receptivity. Um, but for most species, uh, the dating period is rather short, shall we say. 
Uh, and what happens is if it's a dragonfly, the male will actually grab the female by her head, literally by the eyes, out of the air. And so what you see here, this is the male. And by the way, this is our, the bug fest model uh, theme insect, right? This is the Halloween pennant, the same one that's on the posters. Um, here's the male, and you can see he's actually grabbed a hold of the female's eyes by these structures at the tip of his abdomen. He does this capturing her out of the air. And you'll notice then she's curved her abdomen up to make a connection here. In insects, the reproductive structures are always at the tip of the abdomen. But odonates are unique in that the males have a secondary set of reproductive structures that are at the base of the abdomen. And that's where sperm transfer actually takes place. So he actually has to transfer from, from his reproductive structure, sperm from here to there, and then she curves her abdomen up uh, in order to uh, actually mate. So here you can see, you might in that previous picture be thinking, how in the world can he do that? Well, a lot of yoga. Uh, basically, here's the male. He's curving his abdomen up. He's transferring sperm there. This is why he's holding on to the female. And then they make this what we call will formation, or they're in copula at this point, mating. And they can fly, like I showed you in that earlier picture, like this as well. Uh, so they're, they're amazing in the air that way. Um, as I mentioned, the male actually grabs the female by the eyes. You can actually see scarring uh, in eyes of uh, some females, especially if they've mated with multiple males. Over time, you'll start to see scarring. Damselflies, they do basically the same thing, but a little bit nicer. Um, what you'll notice here, here's the male, right? But he actually has grabbed a hold of her behind the head on the prothorax, all right, so instead of on the eyes, behind the head, but then she curves her abdomen again up. And you notice the, the shape that they make there? Very much a heart shape, right? Uh, you can't say nature doesn't have a sense of humor, right? Um, and you've probably seen damselflies in particular, but maybe dragonflies too occasionally, paired up like this. So they're not mating, they're not in the wheel formation, but the male has still got a hold of the female. This is the male right here. here whoop. Ah, sorry, hitting the wrong buttons. There we go. Uh, the male's got a hold of the female, and you might be wondering, why is he doing that? Well, it turns out that the males can actually go in and remove sperm that's been deposited by an earlier male. So that means that the males want to really guard their investment, and so he's basically guarding her while she lays eggs. So here's another pair. Again, the male... Here she's actually laying eggs in this piece of, of floating uh, vegetation. Sometimes you'll see large numbers of damselflies doing this all together. And again, the males are all guarding the females to make sure that it's their genes that get into the next generation. Another cool thing that odonates can do is they can actually submerge themselves. So insects respire through spiracles along the side of the body. You've probably seen this in some of the, uh, the live insects and exhibits here at Bugfest. And odonates can actually close those down and then submerge themselves underwater. So here you can see, this is a male's abdomen there. You can see the female laying eggs. Here's a female completely submerged underwater. There's the water line right there. And they can stay submerged underneath, under the water for an hour or more in some species laying eggs. And this is a defense against other males that might come in and try to harass them. But of course, if you've got a male and a female, two individuals that are together in tandem, this makes for a bigger target for, for prey items, or, or for predators, pardon me, right? And sure enough, here's a dragonfly, that eastern panak I showed earlier, that's grabbed a hold of a male that's feeding on this, or that's mating with this female. And so sometimes you'll see something like this. This is a damselfly, female, with the part of a male attached. So you notice it's lacking a head, it's lacking part of a thorax, right? It's because something like that dragonfly has come along and fed on it, but this connection is so strong that that abdomen is still uh, staying attached to the female, at least for a little while. It'll eventually fall off, though. Now, another thing that people always ask about with uh, dragonflies is flight, because they are just amazing flyers. Um, in terms of speeds, uh, they can have uh, speeds of uh, more than 30 miles per hour for fast, just direct flights. For foraging flights, you know, maybe around four miles an hour. 
But they're really good in the air. They mate in the air. They capture their prey in the air. They do all these things. They also migrate. Um, and I'll talk about that. But here's how they are kind of pair or match up to other insects. So the, the red uh, bar is the speed in which the insect can fly, right? Velocity. And the blue one is the wing beat frequency. So how fast the, the, the wings are beating up and down. So you can see dragonflies are way up there. I, I'm a little biased, perhaps, but I think dragonflies are probably the fastest flying insects out there. Depending upon the resources that you look at, there are some others, like deer flies sometimes, that are touted as a little faster. Uh, but you can see that they're, they're way up there, over 30 miles per hour. Other insects, like mosquitoes, it's not that it flies fast, but it has over 1,000 wing beats. And so usually those two things are kind of a, in opposite of one another. So if you have a lot of wing beats, then you're a pretty slow flyer. Uh, but if you have a few number of wing beats, then you're usually a very fast flyer. And as I mentioned, one of the things that these, this fantastic ability of flight in dragonflies allows them to do is migrate. Um, those of you that were here earlier this morning and, and heard about the dragonfly detectives and Chris Goforce uh, work with them, uh, she talked a little bit about migration. Some species can actually cross the ocean. Uh, this is a species called the wandering glider uh, that we have here uh, in the United States. It's found in, in every continent except for Antarctica. And Charles Anderson uh, recently figured out what its migratory path was in southern India and southern Africa. So over the course of about eight months, four generations, and 11,000 miles, uh, the wandering glider makes a trip, a round trip like this. And that makes it the longest migrating insect. It surpasses monarchs as the longest migrating insect known. There's migration events like this occurring in North America as well. We're still trying to figure out about those. And there's some opportunities that you can uh, help us with with that. Uh, this is Odonata Central, which is a great place to find out a lot of uh, different dragonfly information. You can contribute distributional information. And there are um, also resources on here that will take you to other websites like Pondwatch and Migratory Dragonfly Partnership, where you can help us as citizen scientists learn about these things and what they're doing, not only distributionally, but migration-wise and which species are at your ponds. So I encourage you to take a look at, uh, at that website and also at an app that we have called Dragonfly ID. This will help you figure out what species you have. Uh, it'll tell you what's been seen around you locally, um, and it'll actually allow you to, uh, by just answering a couple of questions, figure out what species you have fairly reliably. So that's just a quick overview of what I think is one of the coolest groups of insects out there. Uh, and I'm happy to take some, some questions. Let's give them a round of applause first. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So yes, we're going to take questions. Raise your hand if you have a question. I'm going to bring a mic to you if you're down here on the first floor. If you're on the second and third floors, you can ask questions too. You'll just have to yell at me over the balcony when I call on you, but still raise your hand and let me know and flag me down if I miss you. So <clears throat> that slide you showed about the migration in Indian Ocean, is, are they helped by any wind currents or how, how does that operate? They are. Distance? Yeah, they are. So they're actually following the monsoons uh, is what's happening. The, that particular species breeds in temporary rain pools. Uh, and so in a lot of places where you see them in that map, like in the Seychelles, go back here, there actually isn't any fresh water except for when, during the monsoons when you have rain pools. And these things can basically, this is one of those species that can go through its um, life cycle very quickly in about 30 days. And it turns out that, that the mons it looks like they're going opposite like they'd be going opposite the wind because of the way the monsoons are, but in terms of the wind currents, the winds above the monsoons are actually going in the opposite direction. And that's what they get really high up uh, altitude-wise, and they're able to, to follow those wind currents and glide for long distances, and that's how they're able to make that long trek. Well, if the dragonflies can fly, then how can they fly then? If, if the dragonflies can fly, how can they fly? Is that... Oh, how do they fly? Okay. 
So dragonflies are really neat in that they can move each of their four wings independently. All right? So they can, they can move them all in, in, in different times in different ways. Uh, and like most insects, they actually, what they do, I'm going to have to use the microphone away from me here for a minute. They'll move forward and then kind of push back like this to go forward. So a lot of times people think insects fly like this. Right? In actuality, insects fly more like this. It's almost like a swimming motion, right? Because they're, they're pushing the, the air back behind them. So they're using all four wings in different directions. And that's how they can hover in place. That's how they can go backwards even. They can reverse in the air uh, because they can move all four wings in different ways. But when they go forward, it's almost like swimming through the air. Go ahead, third floor. How long do they live once they come out of the water? Good question. So, depends upon the species. On average, I would say, uh, you know, about six weeks. Uh, but some, some, like these migratory ones, will live for much longer, uh, several months. Uh, but their longest lived stage is always the immature. That's like it is in most, most insects. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say always, because this wandering glider would be an exception to that. But a lot of times, it's that, that immature stage. Like, um, some nymphs live uh, for up to eight years, for example, but then the adult that would come out might live for six weeks. Do any of them bite? <laughs> if you ask me, no. If you ask my wife, yes. Uh, if you, they can't harm you, like flying around, but if you were to grab one and put it to your fingers, a larger one might be able to, to nip you a little bit. Um, Sometimes what'll happen, which is like they have these weird names. Sometimes they're called horse stingers and things like this, or snake doctors. And the idea that they can be uh, devil's darning needles is another one. The, the idea that they can be harmful to you comes probably from the idea that some will occasionally land on you. Let's say you were floating down the river in an inner tube. They might land on you and try to lay an egg inside you, thinking you're a piece of vegetation. So it's not biting, but maybe a little bit of a sting. Very rare, but it has happened. It's never happened to me, unfortunately, but, but it does happen. Uh, but the only way they could actually bite you is if you were to hold them, put them on your hand, and almost force it. And it wouldn't really hurt. Good question. Do they keep their gills as adults? Uh, so they do not. No, they respire through these open holes or spiracles along the body as adults. Uh, air just basically diffuses down uh, these, these nest network of tubules. That's how they respire as adults. How do dragonflies one. use their eyes to see? So they, they do it very well. Dragonflies probably have the best vision in the insect world. Uh, and they have these little individual facets called omatidia that are in each eye, some 30,000 of them in some of the larger ones. Uh, and so they detect motion more than anything. They can, they can form an image, but it's not as good an image as what you and I would think of as a good image, unless the subject is really close. Go ahead, third floor. Why do they have that Ah. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so why do they develop that pruinescence or pruinosity, that coating that's kind of like the, the plum, that waxy coating? So a couple of ideas we have about that are, one, that it might help with desiccation. That is that it's a waxy covering that will help prevent the insect from losing its moisture. Um, you, and one of the pieces of evidence for that is you see certain species develop more pruinescence in the western United States, for example, than in the eastern United States where it's drier. Um, another one is sexual maturity, right? It just shows that an individual is sexually mature. So it may be one or both of those uh, is, is the answer to that. Three different kinds, and what are common dragonflies around Raleigh? Okay, how many different kinds, and what are the common ones around Raleigh? So. Um, we'll start worldwide. Worldwide, there are about 6,200 species. In North America, something 465 or so. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact number is in North Carolina. Chris might know, uh, but something probably around, I would guess, 185-ish maybe. 
Uh, and North Carolina is a very well-known um, state for dragonflies. There have been one person in particular, but a couple of people over the years that, uh, that have done a lot of collecting in North Carolina. I'm not sure right around Raleigh, but uh, probably over 100 species over the course of a, of a year uh, and multiple years you could see here uh, in Raleigh. Uh, uh, some of the ones that I showed up here you certainly would find, the common whitetail, eastern pond hawk. Uh, but North Carolina and the Raleigh area are a great place to be if you're interested in dragonflies. Halloween pennants around here, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the... The posters for Bugfest, the dragonfly that's on there, you mentioned this too, is the Halloween pennant, but that photo was actually taken by Chris Goforth, who's the museum's head of citizen science and our resident like dragonfly expert. So yeah, she knows a lot, but she checked on how many are in North Carolina or this part, and she says your Odonata Central website says 184. 184, I, I guessed 185, is that pretty good? That's pretty good. <laughs> We've got time for a couple more questions. <clears throat> do they have night vision? Do you know of any species that can see at night? Yeah, so that's a great question too. So for a long time, we did not think that dragonflies flew at night. But of course, we said that dragonflies can cross the ocean. So those two things don't seem to, to coincide, right? I mean, how, they, they certainly don't fly so fast that they could cross the ocean in, during one day period, right? So yes, some can fly at night. There's evidence that there's actually more flight activity than we thought uh, at night, although most of them are, are diurnal uh, and fly during the day. There are a number of species that are particularly what we call crepuscular. They fly at, at dusk uh, when it's very hard, twilight basically, when it's hard for us and predators to see them, but they can see very well at those times. We'll come back. Right there on the second floor, what's your question? How do they breed? So we covered this once, but what's the short answer? So adults basically, like most insects, have uh, holes or down the length of their body that are connected to a series of tubules, and air just diffuses in and oxygen diffuses out, and that's how they respire, how they breathe. So you breathe by using muscles in your body to push your lungs open and close, and that sucks air in. These guys, the air just moves into them and out of them. That's right. Instead of like lungs and muscles like we have. Okay, uh, I see lots more hands now, but I'm going to get just one more. If you have questions, though, come up and see us afterwards. I'm going to go up here. How do they eat their prey? Do they have teeth like we do? They, they have mandibles, so essentially, yes. Yeah, they have mandibles. That's where the name Odonata comes from. It means tooth, and so the, the uh, adults will feed on their prey just chewing down with these big mandibles that, have, that are tooth-like. They so grab like, their prey, though, typically out of the air before they start feeding on them. So they catch it in midair, and then they like, have teeth on the outside of their face. That's right. They crunch it up and eat it. That's it. Well, John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming to Bugfest. Thanks all of you for participating in Bugfest this year at the Museum of Natural Sciences. I hope that you find even more cool and incredible bug stuff to do here at the museum today. We have another presentation at 3 o'clock, so I hope you'll come back for that one, and then again at 4.30. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time.